Okay, let's continue uh, looking at the wealth of Babylon the Great. Now, here's some of the scriptural qualifications. So the woman, Babylon the Great, was array in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls and holding in her hand a golden cup. Merchants of the earth had grown rich from her and from the power of her luxurious living. Uh, 187, she glorified herself and lived in luxury. She says, I sit as a queen. Uh, chapter 18, 14, verse 14. All your delicacy and splendors are lost in judgment, and all this wealth has been laid in waste. So, let's go deeper into this. Let's look at the wealth of the ruling family of Saudi Arabia, the Saud royal family. Now, this all pretty much started uh, 1932-ish. 1932-33, where the tribe of al-Saud comes to power. And now that we have King Fahd uh, self-proclaimed and establishes the kingdom of Saudi Arabia under his family's name and grants exploration rights of to Standard Oil of California. So the Saud royal family here, they're royalty, but only why? Because they proclaimed it. I'm royalty. That's it. Self-proclaimed. Um, who done it of the greatest magnitude of a given hour? Prior to this time, there was no kingdom in Saudi Arabia. There was no king. Islam is definitely not interested in a kingdom nor royalty. They seek a caliphate, a caliph. Uh, that would be the spiritual uh, and political ruler of their kingdom, for lack of better words. But uh, uh, And they would love to see a caliph, a caliphate, take over and take control of Saudi Arabia, as well as its vast wealth of oil that is monopolized by this family uh, that call themselves the Saud royal family. Well, uh, after the self-proclamation in 1936, they struck it rich. They strike oil, and they formed this Arabian-American oil company called Aramco. And uh, so then what happened? Well, that's uh, I'm going to quote a former CIA agent, Arthur Robert Baer. Ibn Saud's offspring and their offspring would become some of the world's richest people. Famous from the casinos of Monte Carlo to the brothels of London for their profligacy, the lords of billion-dollar palaces, not multi-million dollars, billion-dollar palaces, owners of the best thoroughbreds and yachts, donors of university chairs and college laboratories, buyers of influence in every capital of the West ready to whisk around the world at a moment's notice on fleets of private jets, which also include a Boeing 747. So, uh, the Saud royal family, I took this out of the House of Saud, Saud royal family news and information website. This is a November 2018 um, article, which says the net worth of the Saudi royal family sits around 1.5 trillion U.S. dollars, making them the wealthiest family in the world. And the current monarch, King Salman, which is they're still there today, has an estimated net worth in excess of 18 billion. One of his sons, Al-Walid bin Talal Saud, you're going to hear a lot about him, has a current net worth, and this is 2018 numbers, of 17 billion U.S. dollars, even though his wealth has been as high as 36 billion dollars. He also owns a 5% stake in Twitter. Also a large stake in the News Corporation, which is Fox's news parent organization. Interesting. Now, I got a 2022 update from, from WealthyPersons.com. And it talks about the family, 
now has an now has an estimated 15,000 members so with all these many 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 wives that they all have and you know, the numbers add up although only 2,000 family members of the family are in power and also possess wealth the family is one of the wealthiest families in the world now their net value is 2 trillion dollars wow we read in that revelation 17 verse 4 about the woman being arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls and with a golden cup well while the sod family promotes the strictest puranical radical form of islam and we're going to get into that which is called wahhabi uh on the on the other side of the coin they live a life of a thousand and one nights lifestyle of alcoholism recreational drug use serial rape orgies homosexuality child molestation uh, sod's father uh, who was Ibn Saad. He was king from 30, 1932 to 53. Well, um, on a trip to Egypt, he asked the Egyptian foreign minister, uh, this country is full of pretty women, and I would like to buy some of them and take them home. How about 100,000 Egyptian pounds worth of them? King Saad. So one of his sons, who ruled from 53 to 64, he was a notorious alcoholic and a homosexual pedophile. Uh, you got even Saud's grandsons uh, going all over the place while traveling to Paris and London. And by, when he, by the way, many of them, they own these beach palaces that are kind of away from the Saudi uh, morality uh, police. Well, they paid prostitutes with solid gold watches that had a picture of their father, King Saad, on the dial. And here's another one of the grandsons uh, of the Saudi royals. Uh, let's just call him Mr. Shalan, was indicted by a Florida grand jury in 2002 on charges of using his own personal airplane to transport over two tons of cocaine wow so do they live a life of excessive luxury well this is just part of a, um, a collection of cars by one of these grandsons that you know he just takes with him when he goes over to europe uh, but the important thing in all of this is that this is a very important defining characteristic when we're trying to determine who is babylon the great the great harlot and that is her lavish lifestyle. As uh, in Revelation 18 says, uh, she glorified herself and lived in luxury. And these are, by the way, gold-plated cars. Uh, the SUV, um, I think it was made by Bentley. And uh, they had them put an extra set of axles in the back. So it's a six-wheel, um, six-by-six vehicle. Now, what about uh, Mecca, the city? Is it a city of luxury? Well, yes. Uh, here is uh, what's called the Abraj al Bayt Tower that overlooks the, uh, the mosque uh, and the Kaaba. Uh, and this building, by the way, is the third highest building in the world. It's higher than anything we have in the United States. Uh, but uh, only the third? Yeah, well, they're, they're building one that's even going to be taller over the one kilometer mark uh, in uh, Jeddah. But uh, this is the largest building in the world, and it did cost $15 billion, billion dollars. It does house the world's largest clock that's seen on all four sides. The bottom floors which of this massive building is all a shopping mall. It's got seven hotels, um, obviously rooms with a view, and it has two helipads, um, 
why enter from the ground uh, and, and park your Rolls Royce when you can fly in on, on a uh, helicopter, right? Well, so that's one. That's overlooking uh, the whole mosque in Kaaba itself. Here's another one. If you notice, both of these are pictures taken from the air because pictures of the ground from the ground looking up just doesn't know justice. This is the Abraj Kudai Hotel, which opens this year. Uh, it will be and is the world's largest hotel. It's got 10,000 rooms. It's got 70 restaurants. It's gone one up. It now has four helipads. Uh, so once again, we're talking about uh, uh, catering to a clientele that just exudes an excessive wealth. And this is a modest building only costing three and a half billion dollars. Okay. Let's look at uh, the spread of Islam by Saudi Arabia. Uh, the rulers of Saudi Arabia, they foot the bill of about 90% of the expenses of spreading their sanctioned version of Islam. Uh, and in other words, they have put out about $100 billion evangelizing their version of Islam, which is Wahhabi. It's a very radical, it's a strict version of Sunni Islam. It's where most of your radicals on, on these jihads uh, come from. It's not supported by most of the Sunni Islamic nations. They're not interested in this. So the, once again, we got more friction being built. Now with this money, they build madrasas, which are education institutions, uh, Islamic centers, mosques. Uh, they distribute literature and the Quran globally. Uh, if you're interested in a leather-bound copy of the Quran, all you got to do is write them. They'll send it to you. Uh, now, here's from a 2005 report called the Saudi Publications on Hate Ideology Invade American Mosques. And uh, a lot of this is the work of a human rights group called Freedom House. Uh, and they conducted a year-long study uh, uh, examining over 200 books and tracts across America. And here's what they reported back. First, a little summary. Muslims in America are encouraged to behave as if on a mission behind enemy lines. And those who then later convert to Christianity or Judaism are told, if you do not repent, you are an apostate and you should be killed because you have denied the Quran. Now let's look at some of the examples. Here's some examples of literature that was presented as evidence by the Freedom House. Now this is from a first grade textbook. First grade. And these young minds are told that every religion other than Islam is false. Here's a fourth grade textbook. True belief means that you hate the polytheists and the infidels. Here's an eighth grade textbook. The apes are Jews, the people of the Sabbath, while the swine are the Christians, the infidels of the communion of Jesus. Now here's a 12th grade textbook. Now remember, 12th grade now, kids are beginning to formulate what they want to do with their life. Jihad in the path of God, which consists of battling against unbelief, oppression, injustice, and those who perpetuate it, is the summit, the height of Islam. This religion arose through jihad, and through jihad was its banner raised high. It is one of the noblest acts which brings one closer to God and one of the most magnificent acts of obedience to God. Wow. In 2005, Prince Al-Walid bin Talil al-Saud, we talked about him earlier, he donated $20 million to Harvard Harvard University. 
he donated another $20 million to Georgetown University to establish two Islamic study programs in the United States. So do you expect to see anything critical coming out of Harvard or Georgetown universities about Islam? They've been bought and paid for. Four other such centers were established at the University of Cambridge, the University of Edinburgh, the American University in Cairo, and the American University in Beirut. Bought and paid for. The year before Prince Al-Walid bin Talil, he donated another $27 million, but this is in support of families of the Islamic suicide bombers in Israel. So if, so if you talk your kid into uh, blowing himself up and destroying a few, um, in their word, minds, apes, Jewish people, um, you have money that's being given to you. Here's a quote from a former USA, USCIA director, James Woolsey, in 2005, in his testimony before the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Government Reform, that, quote, some 85 to $90 billion has been spent from sources in Saudi Arabia in the last 30 years spreading Wahhabi beliefs throughout the world. Here's an article from the Huff Post, 2015. It would be troublesome, but perhaps acceptable for the House of Saud to promote the intolerant and extremist Wahhabi creed just domestically in their own country. But unfortunately, for decades, the Saudis have also lavishly finance is propagation abroad. Exact numbers are not known, but it is thought that more than $100 billion has been spent on exporting fanatical Wahhabism to various and much poorer Muslim nations worldwide over the past three decades. It might well be twice that number, but by comparison, the Soviets spent about $7 billion spreading communism worldwide over a 70-year period from 1921 to 1991. And we wonder why so many young adults are being converted over to radical Islam. Reminded in verse uh, chapter 17, verse 15 of Revelation, the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages, which is their evangelistic campaign. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. So, They have a threat within their own ranks of Islam. And that big, their biggest threats come from Iran and Turkey. Okay. Uh, Wahhabi Islam, um, uh, which is a radical brand of Sunni that Saudi Arabia promotes, has only deepened the Sunni-Shia divide. Many Wahhabis view Shia Muslims, like the Iranians across the Persian Gulf, <laughs> as the Iranians would call it, uh, as, quote, worse than the worst kind of infidels. Well, that's not going to win, friends. Uh, there was a 2016 protest by Shia Muslims in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia, and they had slogans of, the people want the fall of the regime and down with the al-Saud family. So you can expect uh, a rather severe response from Saudi the Saudi government response was to execute 47 of them, 47 Shia Muslims, along with a highly respected Shia cleric named Sheikh Nimar al Nimar. Okay, and the Iranians, obviously, um, there is reciprocity here, and they retaliated by setting the Saudi embassy in Tehran on fire. Now, 
it's worthwhile going back in some, into some history because until the collapse of the Ottoman Caliphate, remember the Ottoman Caliphate, the Islamic Caliphate uh, that originated from Turkey was the largest, most powerful, uh, pretty much out there in the world. Uh, they ruled the whole west coast of Saudi Arabia, including Mecca, the most holy city, Medina, the second most holy city, Jeddah, which is a very prosperous port um, and on the Red Sea, um, and both the Iranians and the Turks, they would love nothing better than to take out the Saudi royals and establish a caliphate that controls all of Arabia, that controls all of Islam, and oh, by the way, controls all that oil that's pumping wealth out of the ground. So that's, shall we say, the beast that the woman is seated on. Now, what about what we're reading about the woman uh, is the great city that has dominions over the kings of the earth and the kings of the earth live in luxury with her? Well, as I said, we need to take a serious look at this especially from our viewpoint of the United States and if uh, is there any seduction of our presidents. Okay, the answer is a resounding yes, but let me just give some quotes. This is first uh, by uh, Laurent Merowick. Yeah, he wrote a book called Princes of Darkness, the Saudi Assault on the West. And he writes, Saudi Arabia buys politicians, government officials, journalists, academics, diplomats, colonels, generals, intelligent officers. It buys experts at bargain prices and countless propagandists and lobbyists. And when it sees fits, it demands television programs be censored. It has flooded the circles of power with its petrodollars. It demands that American companies accept its political conditions in order to be able to do business, a very profitable business, I might add, even in violation of the U.S. Constitution. Let's read on. This is from another source, Robert Baer. We mentioned him earlier, former CIA. Uh, Sleeping with the Devil, How Washington Sold Our Soul for Saudi Crude, written in 2003. The Saudi royals are the single most source of corruption in the United States. And what he wrote is there's hardly a living former assistant secretary of state for the Near East, a CIA director or a White House staffer or a member of Congress who has not ended up on the Saudi payroll in one way or another, or so it seems. And with this kind of money waiting out there, of course, American bureaucrats, they don't have the backbone to take on Saudi Arabia. So let's pick on a few presidents. First one we're going to pick on is Jimmy Carter. Now, he um, established this Carter Center, um, and we see these former presidents setting up all sorts of similar centers. Let's use that word. And the Carter Center 2006 annual report showed that they had a total assets of $412 million, $393,757. Where in the world does that kind of money come from? Well, many of you probably know Alan Dershowitz. He's a Harvard professor, and this is what he had to say. That Carter quote, and this is of a book he wrote, The Case Against Israel Enemies, Exposing Jimmy Carter and Others Who Stand in the Way of Peace. That Carter has bought off, has been bought off by millions of dollars in donations from Arab governments that refuse to recognize Israel and from Arab rulers who actively promote Jew hatred in the Middle East and elsewhere. Investigative journalists have revealed the extent in which Carter has been bought and paid for by Arab and Islamic money. The Carter Center, a philanthropic foundation that the former president started after leaving office, 
has received donations in excess of a million dollars from Saudi Arabia, the UAE, the Sultan of Oman, and groups and individuals with close ties to these governments, including OPEC, the Saudi bin Laden group, the, the late Saudi King Fahd, who himself, a founder, member of the Carter Center. Interesting. So what was the Saudi return on the, all this money, on their investment? Well, first and foremost, President Carter, he became an outspoken critic of Israel. What he had to say was quite vicious. Carter wrote the book, quote, that was called The Palestine Peace, Not Apartheid. And when he wrote that book, 15 members of Carter's advisory board resigned over this book. There was a lot of journalists that really uh, poo-pooed all over this book. But uh, of these members of the advisory board that resigned, it include Kenneth Stein, who's a tw who was a 23-year board member of the Carter Center. And he wrote an open letter that Carter's book was, quote, replete with factual errors, copied materials not cited, super uh, superficialities, glaring omissions, and simply invented segments. Now, what was Carter's response in all this? Well, all these board members, they, they left because of the pressure uh, from the Jewish lobby and the lobbyists. Now, here's a statement made by the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting in America, and they report, the reported hundreds of millions of dollars from Saudi and Gulf contributors that have flowed into the Carter Center, as well as the vast sums of Arab money donated to American universities, think tanks, lobbies, religious institutions, and other opinion-shaping institutions elicit no concern whatever from Jimmy Carter about Arab influence on American foreign policy. So, uh, the return on investment, well, first of all, what they're investing in is uh, opinion-shaping institutions, be it people or organizations in the United States. So let's look at George Herbert Walker Bush and his son, George W. Bush. Now this is a quote uh, from Craig Unner who wrote the book called House of Bush, House of Saud, the secret relationship between the world's two most powerful dynasties. And he writes, at least one point four, seven, six billion, billion dollars had made its way from the Saudis to the House of Bush and its allied companies and institutions. It could safely be said that never before in history had a presidential candidate, much less a president uh, presidential candidate and his father, a former president, been so closely tied financially and personally to the ruling family of another foreign power. Never before had a president's personal fortunes and public policies been so deeply entwined with another nation. A very, very damning statement. So what was the Saudis' returns on this investment? Well, the biggest return was silence looking the other way. Uh, there were 28 pages that were removed by the Bush administration from a congressional report of the joint inquiry into the 9-11 attacks that uh, was not discovered until January 2016. Hmm. Now here is an article, 9-11 uh, disinformation Saudi Arabia attacked America by the Foreign Policy Journal, May 28, 2016. There are 28 pages classified secret of a congressional inquiry into 9-11 that allegedly found Saudi financial support for the alleged 9-11 attackers. Neither the George W. Bush nor the Obama regimes would release the classified pages. Only a few members of Congress have been permitted to even read it under guard, and they are not 
permitted to speak about it. Now, on a side note, uh, I found where there was a report that was sent to the UN Security Council uh, that reported, quote, Saudi Arabia transferred half a billion, once again, we're using these humongous numbers, half a billion dollars to Al-Qaeda in the 10 years beginning in 1992. Uh, this is your investment on Wahhabi Islam. Here's another interesting uh, fact. On 9-11, the United States shut down its airspace for all flights, foreign and domestic. Uh, being uh, from a previous background in the FAA, I'm very familiar with the procedure. It's called Scatana. However, except for those owned by Saudi princes, they were allowed to get on their airplanes and fly out of the United States. And oh, by the way, 15 of the 18 hijackers, in case uh, we forget, they were Saudi citizens. Okay, how about Bill and Hillary Clinton? Now, this is an article from the Daily Caller titled Persian Gulf Sheiks, and you give Bill and Hillary a hundred million dollars. Okay, chump change compared to billions. Bill and Hillary Clinton received at least a hundred, so it's at least a hundred million dollars from autocratic Persian Gulf states and their leaders, potentially undermining Democratic presidential candidate Hillary's claim that she can carry out independent Middle East policies, of course. And as a president candidate, the amount of foreign cash the Clintons have amassed from the Persian Gulf states is simply unprecedented, says national security analysis Patrick Poole. We also have PolitiFact that reported that Saudi Arabia's government donation specifically, well, it, it only amounted something closer to $35 million um, into the Clinton fund. However... That did not include donations given by Saudi Arabian private individuals. So what was the Saudi return on their investment? Well, in 2011, the State Department cleared an enormous arms deal led by Boeing. A consortium of American defense contractors would deliver $29 billion worth of advanced fighter jets to Saudi Arabia, despite concerns over the kingdom's troublesome human rights record. In the years before Hillary, <clears throat> excuse me, Hillary Clinton became Secretary of State, Saudi Arabia <coughs> had contributed $10 million, $10 million to the Clinton Foundation. And just two months before the jet deal was finalized, Boeing, they donated 900000 to the Clinton Foundation according to an International Business Times investigation released Tuesday. Hmm. I wonder why they kept it just under a million dollars. The Saudi transaction is just one example of nations and companies that have donated to the Clinton Foundation, seeing an increase in arms deals while Hillary Clinton oversaw the State Department. Just a coincidence. Nothing here. Let's move along. So, seducing presidents. We've looked at the scriptural requirements. We looked at just three examples. I could give more. Um, one might be uh, Congress almost unanimously passing uh, a bill that uh, American citizens that had lost loved ones uh, from 9-11 attack could sue the Saudi Arabian government. Well, guess who vetoed that bill? President Obama. Guess who overrode his veto? Our United States Congress. And I think it was like a 98 to 2 uh, vote. But in summary, the Saudi royal family is a perfect fit to this prophecy that's given to us in Revelation about the kings of the earth lived in luxury with her. Now, what about drunk with the blood of the saints? Because we saw... Uh, we read where I saw the woman drunk with the blood of saints and the blood of martyrs of Jesus. So she was known for killing Christians. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. 
in chapter 18, 24, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on the earth. So the question is, does Mecca, Saudi Arabia, and Islam, does it, do they fulfill the scriptural requirement? Well, remember when we did the fifth seal and uh, the biblical definition of martyrdom, we looked at four scriptural passages in Revelation 20, where there was beheading for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God in John 16, whoever from the words of Jesus, whoever kills you, he will think he's offering a service to God, or shall we say Allah. Matthew 24, then they, the Antichrist and his uh, kingdom will deliver you up into tribulation and put you to death and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then we also saw in Revelation uh, 6, 9, the fifth seal itself under the altar of the souls that who been slain for the word of God and the witness they've borne. So the biblical definition of end time martyrdom is going to be very anti-Christian, very anti-Semitic lots of beheadings, belief that the that what they were doing is divinely appointed to kill the non-believers, the infidels, and it'll also be a global movement. And we saw that not only Islam meets all these biblical requirements, but now we see the efforts of the Saud family, royal family, is also very much behind all this. So drunk with the blood of saints for years, the Saudis have provided through the Saudi Committee for the support of the Al Quds Intifada. So this is a government uh, effort called the SCSQI that the surviving families of Palestinian suicide bombers are given a twenty-five thousand dollar reward. Now these are poor, poor, poor people, and twenty-five thousand dollars, which is just breadcrumbs to the Sauds, is big money for them as well as an incentive. If you want to get your family out of debt and um, start living a, a, a lifestyle of uh, wealth in their given area, well, you could strap on some bombs. In 2002, Saudi Arabia held a national telethon raising funds for the SCSQI. The Saudi royal family as a whole contributed about $50 million dollars. And this Saud prince, Al-Walid bin Talal, pledged himself $27 million. This telethon was hosted by a prominent Saudi government cleric, Sheikh Saud, Saud al Barak, who on live TV said the following, I am against America until this life ends, until the day of judgment. I am against America, even if the stone liquefies. My hatred of America, if part of it was contained in the universe, well, it would collapse. She is the root of all evils and wickedness on earth. Muslim brothers in Palestine do not have any mercy, neither compassion on the Jews, their blood, their money, their flesh, their women, they're yours to take. Legitimately, God made them yours. Why don't you enslave their women? Why don't you wage jihad? Why don't you pillage them? Very damning statement. Here's a quote from the Brown Political Review uh, on an article titled Financing Terrorism. Saudi Arabia and its foreign affairs. Today, the most violent jihadist terrorist organizations in the world find their ideological roots in Saudi Arabia, which is Wahhabism. Whether we are speaking of Al-Qaeda, which is global, ISIS, which is Syria, Iraq, Libya, and Sinai, the Taliban from Afghanistan, the Abu Sayyaf from Philippines, the lashkar e taiba from Pakistan, the Jabhat al-Nusra from Syria, the al-Shabaab from Somalia, or the Boko Haram from Nigeria, they are all Salafi groups whose ideological roots extend directly to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. If there is one nation in the world that is most guilty 
for the vast number of terrorist attacks that continues to expand throughout the earth over the past few decades, there can be no question it would be Saudi Arabia. Wow. And the Saudi uh, uh, that they're talking about, they're all Saudi uh, Salafi groups. Uh, Salafi is better known as the Wahhabi Salafi Islam and Jihad, this radical brand of Islam that Saudi Arabia is pouring billions and billions of dollars around the world promoting. So another requirement is that this harlot is going to be a kingdom of slavery. Revelation 18.11, where it talks about the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore, as well as what? Slaves, that is human souls. Well, over 90% of the non-governmental jobs in Saudi Arabia are filled by foreign nationals, foreign laborers. They're like carted in um, on airplanes. Six million immigrants who do the work, Americans, Europeans, Indians, Pakistanis, Filipinos, Egyptians, Palestinians, Yementis, Koreans, all mercenaries deprived of their basic rights, virtual slaves who keep the machine running, who assemble, repair, manage, and construct. The kingdom consumes the Saudis. They despise those who produce. This is uh, coming out of the book, Princes, Princes of Darkness, the Saudi Assault on the West. Also, Saudi Arabia, they will not sign any UN treaty on slavery or similar human right issues. Why? Because they do not want to be subject to those provisions. Now, what about the sex slave industry? Now, here's um, um, a uh, article, Issue 12, Arabian Peninsula and the International Sex Slave Trade by uh, uh, Sadjusian.com 2016 article Harems and Sex Slaves King Fahd's sons control the child sex ring from the Beverly Hill palaces they learn from Al Fasi palace sex scandals in the Beverly Hills during the 80s and rent motels away from their palaces to conduct orgies with children pr pr procured for them Around these motels, they have cordon of U.S. security guards. An inner cordon is made of the prince's bodyguards, usually foreign. Uh, the younger the child, the more desirable. These children are brought up through the sex ring channel to the point of purchase under the modeling or acting ruses of going for a shoot or a set in Saudi Arabia. Upon purchase... Children are then taken by limousine directly to the Saudi princess plane at Los Angeles Airport. And as we mentioned in our prior newsletters, Washington allows Saudi princes and their entourage to circumvent customs and immigration, which allows them to ship their child sex slaves out of the U.S. without need of the customary passport. The children are then escorted directly onto the Saudi prince's plane, flown to Saudi Arabia, never to be seen again. An abomination to the Lord. Now, we also mentioned um, that uh, the city would have to be either a port city or near uh, the sea, uh, from what we read in Revelation 17 and 18. Um, and Mecca is, uh, I think it's less than 50 miles uh, from um, the shores of the Red Sea, but they're right on the shore with a direct pipeline uh, to Mecca is Jeddah, which is a major port city. you got King Abdullah Economic City, another big project up to the north. But also keep your eyes on this city that's up in the very um, northeast quarter called Neon. Uh, this is a $500 billion project of a future city uh, where supposedly everything is going to be within five minutes walk. Uh, there will be no cars, uh, transportation underground. They're going to have what's called the line up into the mountains. Uh, they're going to circumvent uh, the Suez Canal. Uh, and if you notice, there's a little corner here in Israel that uh, kind of... Um, shall we say, is a showstopper in all this. But guess what? They've reached out to Israel. They've talked about putting in a, uh, a port 
up here and a high speed rail that will ship goods through Israel into the Mediterranean Sea. Um, the incentive uh, from the shipping industry will be enormous because the Suez Canal is known for being glacially slow uh, in moving goods and services. So uh, we've looked at the Re uh, Revelation 17 and 18 descriptions. Um, one that I thought I had put in this presentation, but not we've done in the previous presentation was that Mecca is seated on seven mountains and we showed an Arab uh, news uh, review of talking about Mecca and the seven mountains that it stands on. Uh, so all these descriptions that we've gone through, they're all met by Mecca, by the Saud royal family, by Saudi Arabia. So we'll end um, with the beginning of Revelation 19. Revelation 19 verse 1 says, After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. So this will be the gory outcome of Babylon the Great. And I would just like to end this uh, session with the words from King David because he has such an important, relevant pastoral message to all of this. It's found in Psalms 37.1. We'll look at the first 11 verses. Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. And he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun, which we just read about. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For those who are evil, they will be destroyed. But those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land, will be part of God's kingdom. A little while and the wicked will be no more, which we're reading about in Revelation. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. So amen and amen. And we will end on that note. Thank you, almighty God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done.